you know, I wrote a monograph a few years ago explaining why central banking was the barbarous relic. And here's a good example of it, you know, basically how they're destroying the currency. Because once you erode the currency and the currency's usefulness, you're ultimately destroying the economy. And when the economy is destroyed, then everybody's hurt. Right. And I think that's probably the beauty of what the Bundesbank had in the sense that it was politically independent. Uh, and they guarded that independence, but mm -hmm. would you agree now that the ECB is very much a political animal? Totally. <laughs> well, I certainly think it, when Mr. Draghi's been there for all of like two days and he immediately cuts the rate by a quarter of a point, not that it makes any difference, but it's, you know, acts as some kind of stimulus for the market for yet another day until we all figure out that that's not going to make much difference. Um, well, it does make a difference in the sense that inflation is already over 3% oh, yeah. in, in Europe, and that's yeah. above their target. Yeah. And I think the actual inflation rate is higher than what the stated inflation rate is. Sure. So that's just putting more inflationary pressure and ultimately is going to debase the currency even further. Absolutely. Well, we certainly agree on that. And even when I think of, you know, the real rates, the more they're going more negative. And of course, negative real rates is very positive for precious metals because yeah. how do you maintain your purchasing power. Yeah. Well, is there any other alternative other than gold and silver in terms of where you want to keep your liquidity? Not liquidity, no. I mean, there's things that maybe you can invest in and survive, yeah. such as, you know, maybe productive farmland or farm chemicals. Or, but you're talking about investments yeah, now those as are opposed to liquidity. That's not, yeah, I agree. And I, I recognize that in terms of liquidity, there is nothing else you can do. So you're still a proponent for continuing to accumulate gold and silver? Totally. Let's talk a little bit about silver because sure. you had some specific points in this presentation sure. this morning. You're basically concluding that the numbers don't add up. Do you want to explain <laughs> well, that? When I look at the, the uh, supply demand numbers from 05 to 10, we have a, an approximate 900 million ounce market of uh, recycled and produced uh, silver per year. And when I look at the changes in supply, which have increased a little, and when I look at the change in demand and supply from China, the change in demand and supply from India, the creation of ETFs in silver, which didn't exist in 05, I can come up with 380 million ounces of net change in a 900 million ounce market. And, and that includes the change in supply. So I keep it, well, you know, how can we go from 05 to today and I can identify by going to six sources, 380 million change, how do we keep supplying all this silver to the market? And, I think it seems fairly obvious to me and it even seems more obvious having come here and see the interest in silver. As I surveyed the various uh, sellers of uh, gold and silver here, my question was, well, how much, how much are you selling in gold and silver on a dollar basis? What's the ratio of the two? And I was amazed to find out that they sell as many dollars of silver as they sell dollars of gold, which means they're selling 50 times more volume of silver than volume of gold. But gold, silver is only produced about 11 times more than the ounces of gold per year. And only about uh, five and a half of those times are available for investment because half the silver has to go to industry. Mm -hmm. So how can we buy it at 50 to one when the availability is five to one? It just doesn't compute that we can keep doing that. So I'm really optimistic that the price of silver someday will uh, move away from the influence of the paper market. I think the paper market has had a very, very negative influence on the silver price. And, you know, the day that we finally can't buy that last ingot of silver, uh, we will know that the gig is up for the, for the uh, paper sellers and uh, silver will go to the appropriate price. And I've always thought it should be 16 to 1 because historically it's traded to that, that ratio. I just met a young gentleman here and who studied the history of Europe and the relationship of uh, silver to gold, and he said the actual ratio was something like five to six to one, um, which I'm not that much of a student of history, but I know that six, in recent history, it's been 16 to one. So at, for example, a $1,600 gold price, silver should be 100. Yeah. At a $2,500 gold price, well, we'll see a very significantly higher silver price. Uh, what, what's likely to end the, the, the physical versus paper war that seems to be going on? Uh, is it going to be just eventually that people disbelieve the paper and the liquidity dries up and goes away? Or will there always be people trying to speculate on the price? Well, I think what would end it in sort of my uh, dream situation is, and I'd love it to be me, I, you go out to go and buy some silver bars and you don't get delivery. Hmm. And... Um, that would just indicate that it's, 
they can't make delivery and it would end. Or if, for example, Samsung said they got to produce, stop producing phones because they can't buy any silver. Like it, they're just not getting delivery. Yeah. Some event like that where people finally saw through the ruse of the paper markets where physically it's not forthcoming. Yeah, and the paper and physical markets will just diverge. I suppose not unlike what happened back with the London Gold Pool with gold back in the 1960s. You essentially had two markets, an artificial one that central banks made believe where the gold price was, and then right. you had the free market price, which was trading right. at a much higher premium. Right. Uh, and yet the Federal Reserve still, as a, a remnant from the decisions back then, carries gold on its balance sheet at $42.22, right. which right. is obviously nowhere near uh, realistic in terms of what the market values right. gold as. I mean, I think that will happen. I mean, the physical market's going to win overall someday. Yeah. It has to. Yeah. Because if there's a shortage, of course, and it becomes apparent to people, all those people who've been investing in silver will be reinvigorated because they realize there is a shortage of silver, just as certain people have projected there has to be. Yeah. And then, you know, you'll get more of an interest. And of course, I think the general interest in precious metals is growing anyway. I just look at what's happening at this conference. It, you know, the attendance is up 20%. I'm sure the buying is probably up, buying of metals is up 25%. And these are numbers that don't fit with production increases of two and 4% a year or 5% a year. It just can't continue to happen. So sooner or later, the physical buyers will win the day. Yeah, I know you're a very patient investor or accumulator. Uh, you, when you see undervalued assets, you ride with it until it eventually becomes overvalued. Uh, but would you, care to you know, give an indication of your intuitive feel is are we getting close to that day when paper and uh, silver and physical silver you know, separate? Well, we can't be far away. I mean, when I look at the data, and I'm a, more of a student of the uh, physical supply demand than I am of you know, the debilitating effect of fiat currency. Um, even when it's in, in the simple example of uh, comparing uh, 2010 to 2011 in gold, we had the IMF selling 400 tons last year, and central banks are estimated to buy four to 500 tons this year. So we have an 800, eight to 900 ton change in a 4,000 ton market mm -hmm. that didn't grow. Yeah. Like, I don't know how that happens when I read about everyone else is buying more gold. So there has to be a shortage, and I have to conclude that central banks are probably still leasing gold. And I always think someday they're just gonna look in the cupboard and say, we got to stop doing this, yeah. which they've sort of said already, but I suspect they still are. You know, I've sort of sensed just from you know the way the market's been um, uh, trading that you know we've seen backwardation in the metals before. Uh, I sort of sense that there's a backwardation presently. And there was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday where they were talking about the LIBOR rate really didn't truly reflect right. you know the underlying interest rate. You know, so by implication, if the LIBOR rate is not the accurate rate, right. then the supposed contango in the precious metals is not accurate, right. and that the reality is that the precious metals are in backwardation, which to a certain extent we can see anyway, because you know, spot physical trades at a premium yeah. to uh, the, the spot market, yeah. and you're very close to physical anyway, so there yeah. already is like a natural sure. backwardation. And it's even, it's more, the, the fact that the uh, physical silver trust trades at a premium of 18 to 22 percent is to me a validation. And, Quite frankly, if I was one of the guys short silver, I'd be buying. I'd be buying this broad physical silver trust because at least I know I'm going to get the silver. Yeah, it's at least someday. there someday. Yeah. Someday, yeah. yeah.